Hello, um, thanks for coming, thanks for staying. I think a lot of people start to just drop and get the train and things like that. <coughs> which um, is a long way to London, so you can't really blame me, I suppose. So um, I'm going to talk about um, well, Hamill's piece of string. <coughs> and the reason why um, I have to call it that is because they are, this um, session that is because for two reasons really. One of them is because many times in my sort of development career, which I do less development these days and more sort of um, script mastering and um, coaching, that sort of stuff. Um, many times I've been sat at my desk coding away in, in my own little world, uh, like, like things used to be um, in the bad old days. And a manager would come up and say, you know, how long is this piece of work going to take? And you have no idea because you don't know any of the details. The first thing that comes to mind is you know, how long is a piece of string? Might as, well, yeah. Might as well say that. So it's not particularly professional response, but certainly not what's going through in my mind. But also, the other reason why I um, titled this session um, of Stream is because there's a part of it which um, we will pull the piece of the string out of the bag and we will predict and forecast before each piece of string comes out how long it would be likely to be based on. It's very simple sort of technique which I'm going to show to you today. Um, now I'm not a statistician, um, I'm, a, I'm a developer, I'm a, sort of a, a manager, a coach, um, and the reason why I'm sort of doing this today is because it's something I just sort of um, became aware of something that was a very, very simple method um, to very easily give some forecasting information. Okay, so. Um, estimating, now I'm not going to repeat um, Mike Pierce's uh, uh, great presentation from yesterday, but um, he did a session on estimating and all problems with estimating, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but the reason why we do estimating <coughs> is because we want to do some planning. Um, and also, if we want to, um, when we're doing group estimation in, in our child, we do it as a team, and that gives us uh, ability to identify risk areas and it also gives us an ability to share knowledge. So, how about estimating in terms of a basis for planning? Well, there's a couple of case studies here. This first one has over 150 data points. Um, the estimations were done using planning poker, so it's quite sort of fine grained um, planning. And it was also using the trivariate estimates where you take high and low values and um, you can get a kind of a picture of almost like a huge sort of distribution, which can give you an idea of if you've got a large range, um, that might show you that that's quite a risky or un unknown um, sort of story that you're estimating for. So that's a little bit probably more than most people would do for estimates. Um, this is the sort of estimated size in story points against the actual size, which was measured in hours. We were using, we were using TFS, um, so therefore the hours were not involved in the user. So, although there's no direct relationship between story points and hours, there, you can see there there's no, also no relationship between the estimates and the actuals, which is, you know, the fact that it's all scattered all over the place shows you it's not very, very um, predictable. Also, another case study, um, fewer data points. Again, planning poker, and people just uh, send it on one value and read on that one value. Now, on this one, it's displayed differently um, to the other graph. Essentially, what you've got here is different story points. So, these, this yellow band here is the twos, and the threes, and the fives, the eights, etc. So what you would expect is that if the estimates were coming out as um, this sort of accurate, you would expect to see that in each of those bands they'd be more or less flat. But not. Um, so why are we getting low predictability? Um, well, I think it's because of um, the complexity of the work we're about to do. So, um, to explain this, there's David Snowden's Kinevin framework, um, which I'm not going to go into much detail on, but essentially you've got these different quadrants. So you've got simple, which is 
um, Seb Rose tells me is now called obvious. Is that right? Um, and that's, that means, and obvious is because it's probably a better name for it, something like that is maybe using a tap or a door handle or something like that, something you don't need any kind of training in, something that's very predictable um, and that a child can do without any sort of special knowledge. Um, some things that are complicated are things that are more skilled, like, for example, uh, somebody who fixes a watch. Um, they, if you get your, take your watch to get fixed, they should be able to give you a fairly good estimation on how long it's going to take to fix that, because they pretty much know what, what's wrong with it, or what things, what things could be that are wrong with it. <coughs> In software, um, very often we're dealing with complex um, problems. We don't actually know what we're getting into, especially if you're dealing with a, a legacy code base. Therefore, in, in this and in this sort of situation, you you learn as you go, and you cannot possibly know the full answer and the full extent of the problem at the point where you're estimating it. And then there's also this chaotic, um, which is more like an emergency sort of state, but we're not bringing really those down today. Um, so when we estimate, we kind of assume that we're in this complicated and simple space. So you know, if things are simple, it's really easy to estimate. If they're complicated, then yeah, it's, you should be able to work out um, what's involved and, and give a reasonable estimate of how long it'll take. Um, in reality, though, I think you know, possibly we are we're being a bit optimistic and um, underestimating the complexity of the problems that we're solving. So I think that explains why. Uh, you know, well, yeah. well, I think the red bit alone actually explains why our estimates aren't um, necessarily any good against our actuals. Because we just cannot, we do not know the answer, do not know what's involved at the point where we're making that estimate. <coughs> In some cases. Um, also, an estimate is not a, a guarantee, although it's taken to be. In some cases, um, and also, uh, for example, in aerospace, uh, plus or minus fifteen percent is considered to be good. Plus or minus fifteen percent is a lot of money when you're talking about um, you know, aerospace components and projects and that sort of thing. Um, and I think that the software is more complex than. Yeah, aerospace stuff has, has a lot of software here yeah, actually as well nowadays. But you know, if you're actually manufacturing widgets, it's a, it's a bit more straightforward. Once you've got your, your widget machine working, you can just churn them out, just. But that, that would be complicated rather than complex. So I think we can expect less predictability in software, and that'd be acceptable. Also, um, when you get when you're doing planning poker. You can get some sort of social anti patterns. Um, one which I call Name That Tune, which is where it's a sort of one up and shit game where somebody says, oh, I think it's going to be eight points, and, and their colleague says, eight, eight points, I think. Well, are you some kind of idiot? It's going to be five at least. And you know, I could do it in five, and, and the next person says, I could do it in three. So um, it's a bit like Name That Tune, but the, the trick is there is just to make them do it in three, then, really, or find out whether that happens or not. Mm -hmm. Um, and just not being open and transparent with, with each other. So really, that's if you've got a, a sort of a immature or sort of problem team, that's the sort of thing you might expect. Um, also, you, you may not really be using the right sort of tools, and you may not have the right sort of skills to be able to sort of unravel things in a, in a predictable sort of way. You may also have legacy code, which we all know is difficult to change, um, and it's also risky. So you can't make, and you can't do testing that's quick and reliable. You might be able to have one or the other, but you probably won't get both. Okay, so um, what I'm suggesting here is um, is not a new idea. Um, forecasting is preferable to estimating. And the reason for that is that we're not giving one single value that people then assume that is going to be exactly when this particular thing is going to happen. For example, if you're estimating a, a duration, 
um, the chance of it happening exactly at that right moment is, is pretty small, um, given that it's probably a, a, a sort of you know, either one day or you know, a particular date. Um, if people are doing things regularly at, uh, at their estimated date, it probably means that they finished them early and then they've been sat around doing something else for a bit and then they press the sort of finish button on the, at the right time. Um, but in reality, we don't know. Um, it, you know when we have a weather forecast, we, we kind of take it, we accept it. You know, maybe there's a 70% chance of rain. But if, if there's no rain, we don't go around and sort of um, you know, complain to the weatherman to each other about it, obviously, but uh, that's just the British way. But, um, you, uh, you accept that there's, it's not an absolute guarantee, um, and we, we're fine with that, and we understand that sort of culturally. So, um, if we express a value and a percentage likelihood, then that also shows that we, it shows we don't really know for sure, and it's kind of obvious the fact that you've been given both those numbers. If you're given one number, you can assume that it's going to be that number. So, how can we go about forecasting things? And this is where I've developed a little bit of a game. Um, now, um, I've got some experience in, in estimating. I wouldn't say I'm really good at it, but I've certainly done quite a lot of it. Um, I think most people I speak to perhaps seem to have similar sort of views and experiences as well. Um, also, there's a, there's, a, there's a little bit of kind of mathematical stuff which I'll, um, we'll get to in a minute. Um, and that was based, um, I became aware of that from something that Ken, Ken Van Dam said. Um, and I wanted to kind of, that was based on Troy McGuinness's stuff. Um, what he said was this after 11 stories, 12. The twelfth story size is 90% likely to be in the range that you've already covered. Okay, well I thought, hmm, don't know about that. So I wanted to check the maths, and I wanted to, I wanted to check the maths, I thought actually there's something in this. Um, and then I wanted to sort of see how you could sort of adapt that and get some sort of knowledge out of it. <coughs> so now we have a bag similar to the ones you may have seen, it's <laughs> very weak. Um, and in the here is a load of pieces of string, about 100 pieces of string, or more than 100 pieces of string. And what I'd like you to do is um, to pick a piece of string. Basically, I need some measurements. Okay, I need 20 measurements, 20 pieces of string, measurements in uh, millimeters, roughly, don't have to be exact. Um, and I will type them in. Uh, so this, if we can do this quite quickly, that'll be good. Okay. Uh, if you want to start, just sort of take, one take the bag. Yep. Do you want to make it measure? Yeah, and then you can just pass it on okay. to the next bunch. Don't tell us that's not so strange. Um, 740. Hold on. No, I keep it straight. Just remember the number if you can. Keep it straight, you can, yeah. Keep it to a mento. Remember 740, okay? Your own Hang on. Uh, yes. This is a hard task on Friday afternoon. What were you thinking? What was that? 740, You remember any numbers, yeah? Yeah, I only want to know them one at a time, actually. Probably best if you keep it on the air. kicked off the net when I Twenty. Twenty, please. 
Okay, while that's carrying on, I'll continue to um, <coughs> So we've got over over 100 pieces, so we need 20. Uh, 13, 14, so we need 6 more. 6? 3, 6. Okay. 6, 4, 5. 6, 4, 5. Okay, so we don't know we don't know how long pieces of string are, but I guess if we think about it, <coughs> one zero. You need to get people in the bag. No, that's done. We've got money. We'll bring all. That's okay, there's over 100 in the bag. Keep going. 15, 16, 17, 18. Two more. Two more strings. Another 440. One short. One more. Come on, one short. No, there was a 440 there as well. Oh, was it? It's alright, you haven't called it already. No, it's already in there. Oh, it's already in there. There's already one there, yeah. I would say we had enough. Where's the bag? We, I think we've got yours here, Ben. Yeah. Can I miss you, sir? <laughs> <laughs> That's a different kind of experiment. <laughs> 770. I'll do yours later. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure, we haven't got that one already. I've got 770 there, which means. People aren't putting the string back oh, in the back. No. Oh, you have told them. Okay, great. <laughs> Right. Right. Okay, so yes, that was easier compared, you know, easier compared to estimating. Um, okay, so we don't know how long the string are. They're obviously going to be longer than zero. And so you know, you know something they're longer than whatever piece of whatever ball the string is. So it's shorter than whatever ball the string is. So we know something about them already. Um, but based on drawing them one at a time, we want to create forecasts for future strings. Okay, we've got these now, we can actually see what the values are, but I'm going to sort of show you how the sort of math side of it works in a minute. Um, so, based on our previous data, we want to know to a, certain, to a, a known degree of certainty. <coughs> now, we don't know the length, we don't know the distribution. Um, this is where uh, where I've done this before, statisticians tend to have a bit of an issue with this because they, they sort of assume that there must be a distribution and we must know it or we must assume one. But we're assuming we don't know it, okay? which is, I think, um, probably fair in the first place. Okay, so if we've got one piece of string, so we've got this one here, which is 740, that, is, um, that represents the entire set of data that we've got at the moment. Um, <coughs> so if we, if this is the measurement here, it's somewhere in a, in a theoretical continuum, <coughs> it's somewhere in that continuum, and in, uh, it is, if, if we were to take the next piece of string, that is likely to be, it's just as likely to be larger or smaller, we don't know any more than that. Okay. Um, so what I'll do is I've got a, a spreadsheet in a minute, I'll put these into and we'll see what the sort of the forecasting, what the maths sort of side of it, the numbers come out to be. Um, but this is kind of how it works. So it's pretty simple, right? Um, okay, two pieces of string. 
Again, we don't know whereabouts they are in, the, in this continuum. We don't know what the largest value is likely to be. Really. We don't know what the smallest value is likely to be. At the moment, all we know is we've got a, a smaller value and a larger value. And we can only assume that it's the next piece is likely to be, it's, a, it's equally likely to be either lowest or highest or in between those two values. Okay. Um, Etc. So three pieces goes to four, so it's twenty five percent likelihood in each of those slots. So just to so this here is um, that's the lowest value there, and that's the highest value there. So it's, it's, these are just sort of the spectrum, the whole the whole world, the whole universe. Um, so there's kind of an equation for that, and the number of slots. <coughs> called S, um, where the next measurement could go is the number of existing measurements, that's one. So you know, when we had one string, one piece of string, it would go two positions, when we had two pieces of string, there were three positions, so it's just basically one more than however many pieces we've got, however many data points we've got. So there's a nice little equation there, S, which is slot, E plus one. Um, and then the probability of something, of the next piece being in any one of those slots is 1 over e plus 1. So it's what, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, whatever. Which is 1 over e plus 1 is 1 over s. Same thing. Okay, so now, okay, I don't want that bit. Um, so if, if I go back to the spreadsheet, I'll stick some of these values in. I did have, when I've done this before, I've had an iPad that that's, um, goes up to Google Docs and then I pull the values in, but I wasn't sure I could trust the Wi Fi. <laughs> and as it turns out, I'm using the Wi Fi now anyway. So. Um, right, so the first one, just, we've got one data point. Um, just for information, fairly irrelevant to be honest, is the minimum. Yeah, you need to drag it onto oh. the screen. Oops, or mirror. Mm -hmm. um, what do I need to do actually? Mirror your display. Yeah. Display uh, settings. Display settings. Alatus. You don't need to know when you've got someone who can do it for you. Sounds like my wife. Okay, thanks Tom. Okay, so um, we've got here, so I've put 740 in as the first measurement. Um, we've got some minimum, mean, median, maximum information. Probability that the next reading is going to be smaller than the minimum, i.e. outside of the current range, is 50%. Similarly, for the larger probability, it's going to be the same. I've got here is zero. Um, it's pretty unlikely, but if it was, then what it would just prove is that one of those, either one of those, um, were true in sort of negative sense. If that makes any sense. So it kind of works for continuous values and also works for integers. So if you do get the same value, that's okay. It just means that one of your things was, was true. <coughs> Okay, so, all right, why is that not, okay. <coughs> so you can also express that in, it kind of makes no sense when you've only got one value to be fair, I'll go into that in a minute. So, next value is 440. Oh, actually, where's my... Okay, I've got here a, um, a confidence level, which I've put in as 60%. I don't know what you think you know, a reasonable confidence level is for, you know, for a forecast. Um, arguably, 51% is good enough, because it means you're right just a bit more than you're wrong. Um, that may be enough. 
or you know it could be that you want 75 percent or 80 percent or something like that at the moment i've got six i've got 60 percent in there and my um, spreadsheet is telling me that it thinks i think it's there, telling me that it thinks the next one's going to be 740 okay based on the two points that it's got um, Put Sorry, is it saying it's going to be six percent confidence? It's going to be between four forty and seven forty. Yeah. So, well, what it is? Is Sorry. You're not giving a single figure, though. Are you? You're giving it between. Well. Um, and oh. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so, kind of what this is telling us at the moment is that we've got a value there, which is seven forty. We've got another value here, which is four forty. And it's saying, uh, if we want a 60% confidence level, okay, this here is 33%, this here is 66%. So 60% is just below that. If it's going to make a prediction of what it's, what it's going to be, all it can really do is sort of sensibly go to this nearest point here and then say, based on what I know, not knowing anything about distribution, that's because it could be big. That's why it's 60 at that point. Uh, well, that's, the 30, so that, 30, that 30, makes, that's 66%. Yeah. Yeah. And we're asking for sort of 60, which is just below that. So based on the two pieces of information that it knows at the moment, its best guess is that right. it's 740. But it's under 740, is the thing. But it's going to be under 740, right. quite okay. right, is that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Good point. Uh, yes, under 740. Okay, so 60% sure it's going to be under 740. The next number is 650. So it's kind of worked out right there. Okay. So what I've got, <coughs> so one of these things here, tells me that this green bar here just tells me that it predicted correctly mm -hmm. that time. So let's see how it gets on if I do some more. <clears throat> so 650, 470. What are they called? Somebody read that for me? 450. 440. 400. They're all quite close, aren't they? 110. <clears throat> 640. 640. Who, whoever's got the bag, can they, can they see if they can find a really long piece of string? Just to prove that there's some stuff in there. We, we do have a long piece on here. That's one which is a thousand and seventy. That's one over a metre. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite long. long. It's long enough for most people. <laughs> Seems long with the confidence we have with these lengths. Six, sorry, 640, Have a route around in the bag, see if you can find a route. Get, get the five, biggest yeah. piece of string you've got. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Steady on. Three five. metres. Have you got the um? So there's, that's, that's three metres, 3.2 metres, that, that large one. So we're kind of lucky we didn't get that one. Um, but there are, there's a lot of variability, is kind of the point of the illustration, is that there's quite a lot of variability in the lengths of those strings, yet we can make some reasonable predictions. Okay, so if I go down and see where this 60% um, column is, I predicted 740, well, I predicted it, the, the spreadsheet calculated it as 740 being the maximum. It was right because the next one was 650. It all it, it's 740 again. And that was right as well. Then 650. Um, right, I just hide them. Yeah, and you can see the actual values in the next ones. So 60% is quite a low. Confidence, really, isn't it? You could probably go a bit higher than that. 
But look, it seems to be doing pretty well at predicting stuff. There's a couple of there's a couple of got wrong there. There's a few more got wrong, and there's a bad spell. Okay, so it just kind of can't tell how the data's going to turn out. But um, in terms of distribution, this is sort of a scatter chart of where the strings were. There's no real pattern there. We look at this kind of distribution. If this was a normal distribution, that would be fairly obvious. Um, it's got a bit of a sh potential shape to it, like that. Um, however, I mean, normal distributions aren't necessarily, we, we kind of like to assume that things are normally distributed, but the strings in that bag, there's no reason to assume that they're normally distributed. I'm pretty sure they're not. I'm, I've never measured them all in the stacks and all that, but why would they be? They're, you know, they're, just, they're fairly randomly cut. So they're, they're not normally distributed, I don't think. And it doesn't look like they are there, although it might be that if you've got more data, it shows that they don't work. Um, also, I don't need to come, to that, come back to that actually. Um, okay, so back to this. Yeah. Okay, so what you can do also is you could uh, Okay, so this is what we've done is we've taken a, a confidence level um, so we took say 60% and we could take 75 70% um, So this is kind of a little this illustrates pretty much what we were talking about before, although we've got an extra measurement on this example. <coughs> so, um, this is basically explaining what we've already gone through, so I think that's a good deal of this. So, we've got, we can get ourselves a, a value and a confidence level quite quickly, even with two measurements. And we might be wrong, but we've got two measurements, and we're twice as likely to be right because we are wrong. So it's kind of worth knowing that. Um, also you can you can establish ranges as well. So it might be that you want to um, it could be that your range starts at zero and goes up to a, a certain number. Or it could be that you want to know a, something between a low number and a high number. Is it within that range? Is the next thing going to be within that range? So you use the same sort of principle, basically you, each of your slots has a known percentage value. Um, so however many positions there are in between the two values you're interested in, add those percentages up and that's your confidence level. Um, equally, you might say, you might start off with a confidence level and then try and work out what the values are. So you can say, I want to be 80% confident. Um, where should I talk? Where are my points that I can be 80% confident with? Okay, so that's what we've just covered. Um, you can also <coughs> um, forecast an end position. So if you had uh, like 20, 20 pieces of string or 20 stories or 20 of whatever it is we're talking about. Um, you can forecast based on your current data and then projection based on the current data. Um, this, I don't think, it doesn't work quite as well because I think it usually ends up being slightly sort of conservative and sort of uh, uh, pessimistic really, so it actually gives you a bit of a higher number than you would expect. Um, but we can get and derive our forecast for a, a longer range uh, set of values by just multiplying by handling um, by finding the nearest place to the confidence level we want and then just multiply assuming that's your value and then just multiplying by handling that on there. So if you've got um, five measurements out of twenty, you know five of them and you have to forecast it. Okay, so I just show you the other chart. 
So with a 60% confidence, this is what the chart looks like, which is annoyingly small. Um, you can see here that there's a predicted total, and that goes up and down depending on the values that we find. The actual total is a flat line, you know that at this point. Um, as we were going through this, we obviously didn't know that. We only know the actual at the end. So you can see that um, it's done pretty well throughout the, sort of the journey. Um, if I change the percentage confidence, it will change the profile of the prediction. I can do that in a second. They will always end up at the same point because it's because the way it does it is it uses all the stuff it knows about as it goes through each point. So when it's got to the end, it uses all the values that actually happen, which is the same value as the actual. You see what I mean? So they're always going to tie up at the end. But if I change this to, let's say we want to be 70% confident, um, what it's done here is it's started, it's pushed out where, um, the points where it could actually be 70% confident. You probably wouldn't have seen that, but it changed these numbers in that 70% row, which and they are what drives this chart. It has actually changed, but um, not very obviously. In this case, so let's go for 80%. So you should see you, you should see the um, values in the column where the 80 is change, and then also you should see the chart profiles changed. <coughs> so, sorry. It seemed to be I, I don't know whether did the total. I would have thought at the beginning with 80% confidence, going to have to get more. It's going to have to be broader in, it, in its, you know, it's going to be more cautious in its initial estimates of how big the next one is going to be. So I sort of expected that graph to be sort of going from further out from the actual total and coming down when you, when you ask for more confidence. <coughs> um, um, it kind of depends on the, on the data and how close they are to each other. Really. Is it because we've got a good first piece of string? It's quite a high one, wasn't it? So there was above the, average. The first three, well, the two out of the first three were quite high. And then it kind of settled down a bit, um, and then there were some other, some more high ones a little bit later on, which pushed it sort of up here, that bridge there. How did the Are you going to share that spreadsheet, by the way? So. Uh, I, I can. I'm not sure. I think I'd have to set, save it as uh, Excel or something like that, and make it available. I'd uh, be very interested. Sorry, just a, just a, how different would it have been if the first piece of string had been 3.6 metres? That happened last time I did this. <laughs> um, uh, it does, it skews the, you know, it, it kind of, uh, it, it makes the results difficult. Um, so, there's a slide, there's a couple of slides just to sort of finish things off. I think I probably ought to get into those. Um, but there are sort of potential improvements to this, but what I'm sort of hoping to convey is that there's, there's a really, really simple technique that actually gives you quite a lot of, a lot of ways you can describe your data then. You can say, I'm, I'm this much confident about this, this range, or it being less than this, or it being more than that. And you can start doing that with one data point, really. <coughs> um, and uh, you know, the, the, the distribution comes out of you know, the historical data. There's no, no need to sort of assume any. Um, Okay, so where could this be improved? So we know we've got quite a variance in the string lengths. I've done this a few times. I know that there are, I don't know, probably about say eight pieces that are over a metre, and one of them's two metres something, and one of them's three metres something. So there's some pretty large things in there. They do vary quite a lot. Um, so Obviously, if we were dealing with things with smaller variance in the first place, then it would be a lot easier to make a decent forecast. Quite clearly, yeah. but, um, so this is a bit similar to splitting stories. So if we can get things down to a similar sort of size, um, then obviously there's going to be less variation anyway, which makes forecasting a lot easier. Um, where this is sort of can get <coughs> skewed is, is where you do suddenly get a really large piece of data. Um, 
So in, in normal usage where if you had something that would normally be high out of bounds be an ethic and you'd normally split that down <coughs> on, and into a research task and then that's probably bite size. If there was if there were a story you would then the yeah. formula works a lot better on this. Yeah. Um, so the other thing you can do is um, if you've got more data over time, you may choose to, um, if you get sort of a big spike value part of the way along, if you're using a, sort of a moving window, then that spike value is eventually going to fall off and, you know, and you're not be considering that anymore. But that's probably going to give you a bit more useful information anyway because things change over time and you may not be worth keeping that in there forever. <laughs> The other thing that people do in their outline is, is that they, they can identify them, uh, they can just ignore them. They just say, oh, okay, right, that's kind of a one off. Um, it is, it, it is a one off. Sorry? Doesn't that lead to the NASA problem? What's the NASA problem? <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the first shot of the up that NASA had a habit of repeatedly ignoring outlying events and skewing the mean. Right. Um, it's, all got into, so it's, it's in one of Richard Clyman's books. Yeah, the other the, the other important. But taking the mean, actually, while you mentioned the mean, <coughs> is, is something to be avoided as well because the mean may not actually exist. Um, in, it, even, even if the mean exists, um, it's highly unlikely that the standard deviation is called the call. That's quite one thing that a lot of people don't know. Standard deviations are basically useless for any kind of down distribution. So, sure, I, I'm. I'm a Troy McGuinness fan, and I really like his stuff. And I, you know, I believe that you can, you know, predict how long a thousand stories are going to take if you've done ten. It's not really my problem, and I, I'm sort of surprised by it because you know, I've been wanting to use this with story, and I've, I, I can hold off the business in terms of saying I'm not going to estimate stories. Okay, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at lead times, and I'm going to tell you how many, how long it take me to do a thousand. I can predict that. What I can't predict, forecast, I'm going to use the word forecast, <coughs> um, is when we've got this great idea, how many stories are there in that great idea? Mm -hmm. And that is much more relevant, and I know it's a waste if I, if I spend half a day with my team estimating the stories they know about, because it's the stories I don't know about, and the stories that I don't know how many stories there are in this great idea to you know, to give our minimum viable product or a minimum marketable feature. And that's the core of it. And so I'm still sticking with, I'm going to do the most important thing, however long it takes, because that is the thing that's going to, you know, that, that's what we believe will give us. You've got to do something anyway, you know, to get some I data. I know that I have to do something, and I've, I've managed 18 months without doing something. <laughs> well, you've still got to be producing some lots of work, though. Which you can then use as your data points. Yeah, I've got the data points, and I'm not saying why, estimate. So that's what that's why I say if you say how long to do a thousand stories based on this method, I can get a pretty good idea. But I don't know what a thousand stories gives me in terms of the ideas that people are coming up with. So I still, rather than spend a lot of time, you know, you don't need a lot of time. I hope you're demonstrating. You don't need a lot of time to use this method to predict how long a thousand stories will take. You can do 10 stories, and I mean, definitely Troy recommends uh, looking at the outliers and those top 10% say, yeah, definitely the, the NASA problem comes into it. And I sort of I'll go along with Troy on it because I think uh, usually when we've got stories that take a very long time, if most of them take under 10 days, and most actually most of them less than five, mm -hmm. the, the ones which are 60, we can look at them and say there's definitely a special cause in those cases. Um, and so he, he eliminates them on the basis of special cause, and then you know, the forecasts are very accurate. Okay. But it's still... Sometimes you have to. I mean, I'm a no estimates fan as well, but sometimes you are forced into a situation where you, you need, can, can, you need can to... Can we talk about two minutes, minutes left? Sorry. Gents, so I'm happy to talk about this at great length, but um, <laughs> we need to finish off. Um, <laughs> so, uh, limiting the effects. Um, using, using data window. Um, also, we could do initial T-shirt sizing, <laughs> small, medium, large, etc. However, we can only do that when we know what small, medium, and large is. When we've got one piece of string, we don't know if that's a small one or what. Really. So it's kind of a bit of chicken and egg thing. Or you can use probabilistic planning, but again, 
think you need more data for that. Thank you. Um, so, what can we take away from this? We can forecast with a limited amount of data. Um, it's good for the early stage of the team or product or project. So we're using that term. Um, and every every team or project is early. Every new team or project is early stage. So whenever you change people in in or out of the team, whenever you start working on some new technology, whenever you start working on a new type of project, you're changing something sort of fundamental about what the team has been working on and what the team is. So potentially you could you know, use these as sort of fresh data points, if you like, but this is another starting point because the team is now different. Um, the dynamics of teams you know, have a great effect on what they can generate. So the other thing is that it's very easy maths, kind of you know, pre-GCSE maths, um, and you can answer most types of questions that we might want to ask, um, considering, uh, concerning range and likelihood and that sort of stuff. Um, so forecasting is preferable over estimating <coughs> generally, also because it communicates uncertainty inherently. Um, and it's also more useful for risk analysis because you have percentages and numbers that you can work with as well. So you can actually work out um, if you want to do uh, sort of decision um, probability maps for risk analysis. You need percentages to work with. You can't just have zero and one hundred percent. You have to have some stuff in between. Um, and also, it sets realistic expectations, so someone's not going to come sort of beat you up for uh, not hitting a particular point in time because you've given them a likelihood that it might not happen. So, like any forecasting, there's no sort of certainty, so it is kind of a guideline. Um, if you have high risk areas, be well advised to estimate those anyway, um, because out of that you get the um, side effect of knowledge share. Plus, you can also carry on knowledge share as a general matter of course, so that um, that's, you know, that's one of the things you get out of uh, planning poker is that you do get this discussion, you get sort of um, some design ideas coming out, you get some knowledge share you know, of the system as a whole. But also communities of practice, uh, that sort of thing, and generally preparing, that's good. So, <coughs> acknowledgements of David Snowden for the Kinevin framework, Dan Brown uh, for sort of making me aware of it in the first place. Tony Gaines uh, was um, the originator of this sort of um, work, as far as I understand. Um, Nader Tanai for his data for case study B. And then there are a couple of um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you won't find this particular idea in these released books, I don't think, but um, at least I haven't seen it. Um, but they are quite interesting reads if you're interested in statistics and what it can and can't tell you. Um, also, the slides will be available like they are for everybody. Okay, so this slide is now officially out of date because. I won't be looking forward to seeing you on Agile, Agile on Beach 2014. Uh, well, apart from that. Um, and also, if you're in, in or around Swindon, um, come along to the meetup there. If you want to um, contribute something to it, then by all means, get in touch. And then, that's me. I'm done, I think.